Tell me, have you ever heard the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? I thought not. It's not a story a Jedi would tell you. So we're going to learn about Darth Plagueis the Wise before he was betrayed by his apprentice, Darth Sidious. When Darth Plagueis fought with Darth Venomous and ultimately bested him, putting him into a coma, a deep sleep, a deep death-like sleep, and ultimately using that sleep in order to understand the workings of midichlorians and the power over life and death. So, let's talk about how sleep-wake works on UEFI systems. So, UEFI has a series of phases, which you can learn more about in future UEFI classes, but the basic point is it starts with the security phase, moves to the pre-EFI phase, and then the driver execution environment. Now, as you well know, it takes quite a while to boot up the system, and the whole point of things like S3 and S4 is that they're supposed to be faster than having to do a full normal boot. So you want S3 to come out faster, and so how that's achieved is via the boot script. So basically, if there's some sequence of memory configuration, register sets, and locks, and things like that, that would be achieved on the normal boot path, the boot script is a place where the Dixie phase and the PEI phase can basically store some sequence of memory reads, memory writes, uh, register reads, register writes, and ultimately arbitrary code execution. So it can store some set of things that should be done to basically skip and shortcut this entire PEI and Dixie phase on the wake from sleep. So basically you boot along, you save off all your state, you go into the operating system. If it goes down to S3 sleep, then it boots again in the sec phase and then PEI says, oh, hey, it looks like I'm actually waking up from S3 according to this you know, sleep type that I see saved in this register. So I'm going to just not do all the stuff I would normally do in PEI. And instead, I'm going to hand off to something that's just going to invoke each of the elements of the script to set all the registers, read all the registers, write all the registers, write to memory, whatever I need to do according to that script that was saved at boot time in order to boot faster. So it's a good idea in principle, although from this document from 2004, you can see that the boot script table is in ACPI NVS. So that is just a special reserved region, reserved between the firmware when it's handing off ACPI information to an operating system, but it's not really protected in any way. If an attacker lives in the operating system, they can just read and write this content to their heart's desire. So if the previous attack was just go to sleep and wake up and see if stuff is unlocked, well, the defense for that should be to ensure that it's locked and how that's typically done on UEFI systems is via this resume reconfiguration script. So if we look a little bit closer about what kind of stuff can exist in that script, we can see it says things like IO write, IO read, memory write, memory read, PCI config write, PCI config read, SMBus stall, and a very interesting thing called a dispatch opcode. Well, all of these make sense as a way, shortcut way to just, you know, read and write registers and memory and things like that. But the dispatch opcode is basically just a jump to an arbitrary code location. That seems dangerous. So if you have a wake script that's living in ACPI, non-volatile storage memory, which is just RAM that happens to be reserved per agreement between the firmware and operating system, well, a dark Sith Lord doesn't have to abide by the agreements of no firmware and operating system. So let's see what that attack would look like. Here we have Darth Venomous booting along happily and healthily. PI phase, Dixie phase, you know, and let's say that they, you know, finish up all of their locks by the Dixie phase and they're writing the information into the S3 resume script in order to make sure that that thing will also lock things up as it's coming back up from sleep. And then it continues on and it boots to the operating system. Enter Darth Plagueis, who writes to the ACPI non-volatile storage memory and writes in, for instance, a new dispatch opcode that will just jump to some arbitrary con arbitrary location that Darth Plagueis chooses. Now we said S3, the RAM is going to be in self-refresh mode, so RAM doesn't go away between going down into S3 and coming back up, nor in S4. But basically, so the attacker can have some code somewhere, they can have this little dispatch opcode, and it's going to jump into the code when the system starts waking from sleep. So Darth Plagueis says sleep, 
puts Darth Venomous into the coma. And now when Darth Venomous ultimately wakes up from sleep, it's running in an environment where the locks have all come unlocked. That's how things are supposed to work. Those platform resets and other signals indicate that upon reset, of which you know S3 is considered one of those resets, all of the locks are going to go away. So it's running through this unlocked environment, and of course, you know, it's potentially vulnerable during this code execution phase before it gets up to the lock. So if there's any, you know, vulnerabilities, typical BIOS exploitable vulnerabilities, any typical, you know, DMA vulnerabilities, anything like that, that would be a problem. But eventually it will come and it will try to utilize this boot script executor. And what it will do is it will invoke the malicious dispatch app code that Darth Plagueis had put in place and Darth Plagueis will have control once more in the context of a booting system where the locks have never had a chance to yet become locked. And that is why we basically say that this Darth Venomous vulnerability is a situation where it can bypass those things like protected range registers. It can bypass the D-lock bit in SMM, the T-seg for SMM. So it's actually a very, very powerful attack. So the defense is to set the locks via the S3 resume script. The attack is to rewrite the S3 resume script if it's not properly protected. Well, recognizing this, uh, you know, some Intel folks released a white paper saying, you know, uh, here's the way that you actually should implement S3 resume. And uh, let's just augment this picture from our really, really old specification a decade ago. And yeah, you should actually save it into a lockbox, not into just uh, general RAM. So apologies for this blurry thing. That's just what it looks like in the original document here. But yeah, save into a lockbox. Well, what is a lockbox? A lockbox is a concept. There could be many different implementations of a lockbox, like the SMM-based lockbox, a read-only variable lockbox, or an EC, embedded controller-based lockbox. EDK2 provides a default lockbox implementation of the SMM lockbox. So if the attack is rewriting the S3 resume script, then the defense is protect the S3 resume script somehow. And of the somehows that they listed, they basically say, you know, go off and do it somehow. It's up to you. Examples are read-only and VRAM. So I could imagine that working, for instance, via using protected range registers to take some chunk of memory, write to NVRAM, and then cover it with a protected range register. If you have any left, if you have uh, the capability to extend your existing ranges over the top of, of some NVRAM variables, but that would be one way that you might store stuff there and then lock it with protected range registers, for instance, so that Darth Plagueis cannot just come in and write to it. Another way could be via an embedded controller, and that'll be just straight up completely proprietary. However, the vendor implements their embedded controller, then they have to work out some sort of protocol between their BIOS, the embedded controller, both for saving off the resume script and for ultimately reading it back in and executing it at S3 resume time. And then the one that was you know, most considered is the SMM lockbox. So one, if it's an SMM lockbox, that means that if you can break into SMM any way, anyhow, then that means you can rewrite the re resume script, right? So Plagueis running in the operating system, instead of just writing to you know, ACPI, non-volatile storage, just some RAM, instead Plagueis could attack up into SMM and rewrite the boot script, and then they would once again have this opportunity to execute in the context of a unlocked system. So that's another way where, again, breaking into SMM doesn't necessarily guarantee you can break into the BIOS, but in this particular case, with this particular configuration, it might. And then the other way, and the way that uh, Corey and Rafal chose to attack this, is via a dispatch callout. So the resume script itself may be protected inside of SMM, but what if it has a callout vulnerability? So they said out of all of the systems they looked at at the time, none of them were actually using a lockbox except the Intel developer system, which was, of course, you know, typical EDK2 skeleton based. So it was using the SMM lockbox, but boot script in SMRAM, dispatch opcode calling out to ACPI non-volatile storage, that unprotected memory, where Plagueis could, of course, just stick some jump code that would jump out to complete arbitrary code execution. And I found this particularly ironic in the fact that SMRAM, ACPI, NVRAM, and shellcode, 2014, December 2014, you know, 2015, 
that's exactly the same diagram that we had back in 2009 when Invisible Things Labs found their first uh, call-out vulnerabilities. SMRAM, ACPI non-volatile storage, two shell codes. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So the defense for that would of course be to audit and try to remove any of those sort of callouts from the thing. And also you could imagine going to the SMM threat tree and adding all of those sort of mitigations and things. So if you used that MSR that makes it so that if the code calls to code outside of SMM, then it's gonna you know, cause an exception. That would have been helpful. That would have just automatically, you know, if they had been using that kind of thing, they would have found these kind of problems of uh, dispatching to something that's outside of SMM just automatically because it would have crashed when they were doing the development. Now at this point in the research, they had code execution in the context of a unlocked system. They didn't really have to break into SMM in the original implementation, especially with those dispatch opcodes giving them easy access. But just for the heck of it, they decided to anyways. So, you know, BIOS control was unlocked. They could set BIOS write enable all they wanted, but they decided to, you know, show that they could still break in just for funsies. So what they had found in the context of the resume environment is that SMRRs were actually still set and that prevented, you know, a direct write into SMM via the CPU, but TSEG was unset, TSEG had become unlocked, and then they could just do DMA via some peripheral device. This is a trick if you go look at some of Rafal's papers, see this is a trick he's been using for a long time. Operating system asks, asks a peripheral such as a hard drive to do DMA for it and it just points it at something like SMRAM. Now a natural question might be how did BIOSes reset the registers before UEFI? And the answer is I don't know. Now theoretically this could be a research opportunity if you're really big into you know exploiting super old systems. Uh, basically I don't know and I don't care at this point but you know if you really want it would be worth looking into. So at this point I feel obliged to mention that you don't necessarily have to go down the S3 resume script path. Uh, on that wake, so we saw that diagram, you know, sec to PEI, that's S3 aware, that goes to the bootscript executor. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. If it, it all really depends on the implementation of the BIOS. The PEI phase could just say, you know what, I see that I'm not doing a firmware update, so I'm just going to go ahead and lock stuff right here, right now, before it even gets to the point of running the, uh, the bootscript executor. So a BIOS vendor, of course, you know, knows their own code, knows what happens in what order, knows whether they have to keep things unlocked. Uh, the S3 boot script is useful to do all of that shortcutting, but, you know, the real question is why do you have to wait until after that in order to lock your BIOS? Theoretically, you don't. It really just depends on the implementation. Now, the attack against that would be a attacker could try to uh, gain code execution if the thing is actually, you know, executing from RAM at that point. Uh, and, you know, gain code execution before it actually sets those hard-coded locks. And the defense against that would be uh, using an IOMMU like Intel VTD to defend against DMA attacks. Now, realistically, what this actually should be pointing at is just, you know, break into the BIOS somehow. Uh, that's kind of the catch-all that I used uh, in the context of the original breaking into SpyFlash, for instance. Uh, the only reason I mention this is just to you know, point out that's what we did at Apple is we you know, added in, or by, I say we, but Corey, added in the capability to do VTD in order to defend the system against all these sort of early attacks. And with that, we have completed this outline of our class. We've seen the S3 attacks. We've seen how that can augment uh, the capability of an attacker to break into Flash or to SMM because a whole bunch of those locks go away when you go down to sleep and wake back up. They, of course, have to go away for things like, you know, straight up reboot reboots. But the novelty of these attacks is the recognition that even going into these lower power states where things like RAM still persist and attackers can, you know, set up the environment to their liking before they uh, go down so that they can potentially take control upon coming up, that gives a very powerful capability indeed.